In today's video, we'll be talking about classification metrics of the predictive system and the intuitive explanations for precision, recall, and the F1 score. Whenever we design predictive systems, may it be a statistical model or a complicated neural network, we of course want to see how well it performs. We want to see exactly how good the outputs are and not only that, we want to be able to compare it with other contemporaries or state-of-the-art systems so as to make a case for why our one is better, for example. And it turns out that formulating such a comparison is not a very straightforward task. We have to ask the question of quality from a multitude of angles, which requires a good metric to be able to put into cold hard numbers the quality of the outputs, to be directly comparable to other methods, and to be input invariant, meaning that a data set or model working on a certain specific type of data shouldn't have a biased advantage over any other sort of problem. But before we can get started with the metrics, we have to go over some very basic definitions of the categories that we can go group the output into. So say we have a system that makes a prediction about the class of an object. We say that a positive case is when the label or category is the one we're interested in. For example, say that we're looking at detecting errors in a dataset. If we're interested in measuring the performance of identifying the error case, we would class that as the positive case, and normal operation as negative, which is straightforward. Another example is classifying items into four different categories of A, B, C, and D and we want to measure the performance with regards to the class of, say, B. Then in this case, B is the positive one here, and anything else, A, C, and D, are negative cases. Again, extremely straightforward, but the key point here is that all of our metrics are specific to the class we choose to define as being positive. This distinction becomes important and apparent as we explore the different metrics, especially for the multi-class systems. So based on this, we can further divide the predictions we make on some data into four useful groups. When a label is positive and we predict it to be positive, we call that a true positive case. And conversely, if our positive predictions label was actually negative, then that is a false positive. And so on it goes for true negatives and false negatives. These values are usually expressed as, as the actual number of predictions that fall into each category, or as a percentage with regards to all of the predictions that were made. So we'll begin with the most basic metric and formally define what accuracy is. Almost everyone should have a near instinctual understanding of what this is, but let's go through it step by step anyway. So all we have to do to measure ac ac the accuracy of our system is to count the number of right answers and express it as a portion of all the answers we gave. More formally, by our previous definitions, the accuracy of our system is given by the number of true positives and true negatives over the entire prediction set. Accuracy essentially tells us how many answers we got right and out of all the guesses we have made, and notably, this is without any regard for whether the guesses were about positive or negative labels. But of course, there's a glaring issue with this straight up accuracy in measuring performance, and that becomes apparent when we're dealing with biased data sets. So imagine we have a data set that's characterized by almost all of the labels being negative labels, and only say 1% of them are actually positive. If the model then decides to only output negative predictions and absolutely zero positive guesses, it will still be counted as having a 99% accuracy score. And this isn't just a toy example when you think of, say, disease testing or predicting system faults. The normal case in these scenarios will usually vastly outnumber the any abnormal examples. But even data sets with you know, milder biases can have their performance metrics skewed in this manner, just a little more subtly. And this is where a metric like precision comes into play. We can say that precision is a measure of how well you've guessed the label that we're interested in, namely the positive case. And we calculate it by dividing the number of correct positive guesses by all the positive guesses we've made. Formally, the true positive count over the true positive plus false positive count. 
The goal of a system that optimizes for this metric would be to make as few mistakes as possible when guessing the positive labels. And looking back at the example where a system would just guess negative for everything, we'll see that the precision score penalizes the model with the score of zero because it has failed to guess any positive labels whatsoever. However, precision still doesn't paint the entire picture because it doesn't take into account any of the negative labels. And further, this metric can also be defeated if the system just makes one co co correct positive guess and doesn't make any more predictions, giving it a 100% score. So now we have recall, and this is like a counterpart to precision, and it's notably different in that it takes the negative labels into the equation. It asks the question of how many positive labels you found out of the total number of positive labels that exist, almost directly countering the issue seen with precision. And of course, the equation for this comes down to the number of correctly predicted positive labels divided by the number of positives you got correct, plus the number of positives you got wrong. The goal of the system then becomes to try and find every positive label there is to be found. But alas, recall still has a problem, and this is skewing, skewing the score by being liberal with labeling anything as positive. So in the extreme case of this, simply labeling everything as positive will result in no false negatives and thus a perfect recall score. It should be clear by now that the metrics of precision and recall alone have some very severe shortcomings, but also the fact that one sort of prevents cheating of the other score. Cheating to get a recall of 100% will result in a precision of zero and vice versa. In this way, these two metrics sort of complement each other. So the question arises then if we can design a system so that it optimizes for both of these scores at the same time. Namely, we want to make something that incorporates both the quality of the predictions and the completeness of the predictions into a single score. And this is where the F1 score comes in. The F1 score is defined to be the harmonic mean between precision and recall, and the score essentially asks, as said earlier, how good the quality of the predictions are and how completely we have predicted the labels from the data set. Very importantly, the F1 score doesn't simply use an ar arithmetic average to combine the score. In fact, this would be pretty detrimental to in, in the so-called cheating cases we discussed earlier, where a model that just predict predicts negative for everything still gets awarded a 50% score by average. The harmonic mean weights the score towards the lower of the two component scores, and this essentially penalizes precision and recall, disagreeing with each other too much and correctly reflects when either of them falls too close to the value of zero. And that's basically it. The F1 score is definitely one of the most common metrics by which we compare our systems, and for most cases will serve as a good indicator of how, of how healthy your model is performing. However, there are still some cases where it won't be so adequate, especially when we have to deal with multi-class systems for which the performance with regards to each different class is equally important. And by extension, this metric doesn't have true negatives in its calculation, because precision and recall respectively don't have it in their calculations either. These were just the basics covered here today, so just keep in mind that there are many more methods of quantifying system performance. But still, knowing these four basics will set you up for a good start in your machine learning journey.